I hope that when you came in, I know that uh, whoever was passing out the bulletins was passing out this copy of The Essentials. Um, this you can get on the EPC website. If you uh, are able to do that, you Google the EPC Essentials and you can get it. And if you need another copy, I can give that to you. This is for you to take home and read. It's a good thing to be reminded of at least once, maybe twice, three times a year of what we believe, and it will be part of what we talk about today from the small letter of Jude. We started Jude last week, and I said we were going to do it in two weeks, and I realized that it'll take a little more than that. So we're going to do, we're going to do bookends. We did the first two verses last week. We're going to do verse three, and then the last two verses today. And next week we'll start Advent and then in the beginning of the new year, we may look at Jude for a couple more weeks just to see a few more things in this 25-verse letter of the Scriptures. But before we go to the verses for today, let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Most gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day, the bright sunshine. I thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit. Lord, I thank you that we have been able to say, here I am to worship. You are the king. This is amazing grace. Glory be to the Father. Lord, we've been able to sing those things and, and make your name great. We've been able to shout for joy. And now I pray that you would speak to us through your word. Not through anything good that I have to say, but what you have to say to me and through me. Pray that your Holy Spirit would open the eyes of our hearts and open the eyes of our minds to see what you would have for us and who you would have us to be in Christ, that we would be grounded, staked in, and Lord, that we would then contend earnestly for the faith that you have delivered once and for all. Lord, I do pray that the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. You are my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. This week, just chapter, or just verse 3, and then 24 and 25. I'm going to read it in two different versions. First, I'm going to use the NIRV, the one that's meant for kids. Jude, verse 3. Hear the word of the Lord. Dear friends, I really wanted to write to you about the salvation we share, but now I feel I should write and ask you to stand up for the faith. God's holy people were trusted with it once and for all time. Skipping to verse 24. Give praise to the God who is able to keep you from falling into sin. He will bring you into his heavenly glory without any fault. He will bring you there with great joy. Give praise to the only God, our Savior. Glory, majesty, power, and authority belong to Him. Give praise to Him through Jesus Christ, our Lord. His praise was before all time, continues now, and will last forever. Amen. Now from the NIV. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I praise God that our church, our leaders, our elders saw fit for us to uh, make a change a few years ago into a, a new Presbyterian denomination. We were part of what, what the uh, sociologists would call the mainline Protestant church. That's what we were part of. The mainline Protestant church is in a lot of trouble. Here's an article that I found from the Chicago Sun-Times a few months ago. Last month, I guess. October 2017. It's featuring the pastor of Fourth Presbyterian Church, which I learned is a large Presbyterian church 
in Chicago, in the mainline denomination that we used to be part of. The Reverend, Reverend Shannon Kirshner was interviewed in the Chicago Sun-Times, and they asked her this question. Is Christianity the only way to heaven? This is what the pastor said. No. God's not a Christian. I, I mean, we are. For me, the Christian tradition is the way to understand God and my relationship with the world and other humans. But I'm not about to say what God can and cannot do in other ways and with other spiritual experiences. That was her answer to the question, is Christianity the only way to heaven? The Christian Post did an article on her as well in October of 17. And it said, when asked what she thought about hell... She, Reverend Shannon Kirshner, said she doesn't think the God she knows from the Bible will be sending anyone there. Wait a minute. If the Bible is, is true, and the Bible has authority, then shouldn't we listen to it? I mean, she says in here that... Uh, Christianity is not the only way to, to heaven, but, but Acts says that there's only one name under heaven by which all men must be saved. Jesus himself said, no one comes to the Father except through me. Did she not hear Jesus? And then she says, the, Bible, the God that she knows from the Bible will not be sending, sending anyone to hell. Well, that's interesting because the Bible speaks a lot about that. If the Bible's true, and it has authority. Shouldn't we listen to it? And shouldn't we listen to it when it says that the faith doesn't change? It's passed down from generation to generation. This was one of the issues when we left that mainline Protestant denomination. Folks like Reverend Kirshner and people of that idea, that thinking of that theology believe, well, the faith kind of changes with whatever time we're in and we need to correspond with the time and be with the times that we live in. But the Bible clearly says, no, no, no. The faith was given once for all and is passed down from generation to generation. You can know it. You can trust it. You can be grounded in it and share it. So Hanover Church, the truth that is in Jude is that if we are grounded in the truth of the God who made us and loves us, we can gently and firmly proclaim trust in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. If we are grounded in the truth of who the God is who made us and loves us, we can gently and firmly proclaim trust in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. We established last week that this, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is the writing of Jude, who was one of the, the brothers... I don't know if that's stepbrother, half-brother, I don't know how that works, since obviously God was, Joseph was Jude's father, not God. But uh, Jude is, is one of the, the actual brothers of Jesus. And he's writing this letter very shortly after the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And already in that short amount of time, he's saying in verse 3, Dear friends, I was eager to write to you about the salvation we share, but I felt compelled to write to you to contend for the faith, I urge you to contend. The old King James says, earnestly contend. The commentator Matthew Henry says, now we are to earnestly contend, not furiously contend. In other words, we're not supposed to do things that are wrong and make us look like idiots in order to contend for the faith. We are to gently, firmly stand up for Drive a stake in the ground. This is what the faith is. It doesn't change. In 2017, it is not politically correct to say that Christianity is the only way to heaven. And you saw that pastor in the Chicago Sun-Times. She wants to be politically correct. No, it's not the only way. It's our way, but it's not the only way. The faith does not change with the prevailing culture. Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except through me. And Acts says, there's only one name under heaven by which we must be saved. In 2017, we must contend 
for the faith. Just as a few years, few decades after the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, Jude said, you must contend for the faith. Well, Pastor Jefferson, what does that mean? Well, the word that is translated there is the same word from John 3.16. Whoever believes in him, that word believes, the Greek word is the same word here as the faith. It's a verb in John 3.16. Whoever trusts, you've heard me talk about that, whoever leans into, whoever trusts, it's a noun in Jude. And if I take you back to elementary school, you'll remember that a noun is a person, place, or thing. So not only do we trust in Jesus, but there is a set of beliefs that constitutes what is the faith. Well, what is it? Well, everywhere in Acts, when you see Paul or Peter preaching, they start out with, let me tell you about the God who made heaven and earth. So I believe that what constitutes the faith starts with the fact that we were created. The kids know that. Who made you? God. What else did he make? Everything. Starts with there is a God who made us. And human beings are made in his image. This is part of the faith passed down from generations to generations. And just three chapters in, we find out that that good creation, that wonderful, very good creation is fallen and sinful and broken. That's part two of the faith. And then the rest of the faith that we pass down is how we are rescued. What God has done to make things right and restore and bring us back to him and, and make things right centered on the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the reason I passed out the essentials is as I was thinking about what it is that is the faith, I thought, it's, it's here. It's right here. God created us, we are fallen, and he's going to rescue us. Now, if you look at this, I've kind of simplified these. You can look at them later and read this. But in very simple form, number one is there's three persons in one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All are God, all are different, or all are separate, rather. Three in one. That is what part of the faith that we pass down that does not change from generation to generation. Number two in your essentials, this is what in Corinthians, Paul says, this, this, is, this is the deal. Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again. It's stated like this in the essentials. Jesus Christ, the living word, became flesh through his miraculous conception by the Holy Spirit and his virgin birth. He who is true God became true man United in one person forever. He died on the cross, a sacrifice for our sins, according to the scriptures. On the third day, he arose bodily from the dead, ascended into heaven, where at the right hand of the majesty on high, he now is our high priest and mediator. Contend for the faith that was once for all given to us. These are some of the issues right here that mainline Protestants say, well, well, you know, they change the language. They use the same words, but they don't mean the same things. For example, you've heard me talk about the pastors that are out there that preach about the resurrection. They use that word, but they don't mean his body came back from the dead. They preach it as a metaphor for new life. Or they often you'll hear the word salvation. And what they mean by that is taking someone from a bad position into a good position. There's not necessarily anything wrong with that. Because a lot of times mainline Protestants or other folks, they will, they will uh, help people get clean water. So they had dirty water, they weren't healthy, and now they do. That's a good thing. But that's not salvation Biblically speaking, biblically speaking, salvation is the forgiveness of our sins because Jesus died on a cross. 
an actual death. And he actually rose. And he actually ascended. And he was actually born of a virgin. It was a miraculous thing. All of these things you will find if you look in the world today, you will find churches that say, well, you know, the, the silly old church, those poor people back then, they used to believe that, but science has taught us better. We, we know that he wasn't really born of a virgin, probably didn't really die, and if he died, he certainly didn't rise again. That's all metaphorical language. No, it's not. It really happened. And Jude says, you need to contend for that faith. Number three is that it's the Holy Spirit that applies us to our lives and lives in the hearts of believers and guides us and gives us everything that we need. Number four in your essentials is that salvation is fully dependent on God and that those who are born of the Holy Spirit and receive Christ are children of God. Number five is that the true church is not just your name on a roster, but the true church are those who are saved in Christ united to him in a body where the scriptures upheld and preached in purity, sacraments administered in integrity, scriptural discipline practiced and loving fellowship maintained. Number six, that Jesus will come again. An actual event, personally, visibly, bodily. And number seven, all believers are called to proclaim the message of Christ. Notice it didn't say, we pay the pastor to proclaim the message of Christ. It says, all believers are called to proclaim the message of Christ. Jude says, earnestly contend for that. That is what saves people. That is what gives them hope. That is what brings life. And that is what Satan is out to destroy. It's interesting, and we're not going to get into it today. We'll get into it in the new year. But when you read Jude, when you read those 25 verses, that Satan was doing his best internally to destroy that church. Satan will do his best internally to destroy every church. Well, so what, Pastor Jefferson? Let's go back to Reverend... Shannon Kirshner, she doesn't think the God she knows from the Bible will be sending anyone to hell. Well, I'm not sure she read her Bible. If you listen, you hear her starting as her starting point with herself. I don't believe. I don't think. We can't start with what we think. In 2017, Satan would love for us to start with what we think, with what society thinks. But we can't start with what society thinks or what we think. We have to start with what was revealed to us beginning in Genesis 1. In the beginning, God. Contend for the faith. I looked up the definition of contend. This is from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. To strive or vie in contest, or rivalry, or against difficulties. Synonym is to struggle. The example, he contended with the problems of municipal government. They will contend for the championship this year. Second definition, to strive in debate or to argue. Just decades after Jesus rose and ascended. Jude is saying, you guys need to struggle for this. You guys need to contend for this because people will be, they will try and destroy it. Listen to what Peter said, 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Satan wants us to get rid of this message, or to change it so it doesn't mean what uh, the Bible says it means. Jude, only decades after, said, strive gently, firmly, contend, drive a stake down in to this is what we believe, because there's going to be opposition. Something we need to realize 
I think it's taken me a long time as a pastor to realize this. We tend to buy into sort of the American prosperity theology, which is that if I'm following God, things should be going well for me. But the scriptures clearly say the opposite. 2 Timothy 3.12 Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Jesus Christ will be persecuted. All those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus might be persecuted if they live over in the Middle East. Might be persecuted if they live in Japan. Might be persecuted if they live in some place where it's a Muslim nation. That's not what it says. It says, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Think about this. And praise God that he's revealed to us. Paul told us that we need to dress in armor. You dress in armor because there's things coming at you. Jude said, contend. Contend. Why? Because there's things coming at you. Paul says to Timothy, guess what, Timothy? You want to live for Jesus Christ. There is going to be persecution. If we can understand that, we can praise God in the midst of the persecution. We can praise God and contend for the faith. And by the way, we don't do it alone. We don't do it alone at all. Listen to that benediction. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling. We don't go out there contending for the, for the faith unprepared. And there's good news. We don't have to sit in the locker room watching game films for hours. We don't have to go on the practice field and make sure we get in all of our reps, all of our swings, all of our, our throws. Jesus has done that for us. He's done the preparation. He's done everything. And he will work in and through us so that we can contend for the faith because he can keep us from stumbling. He can present us without fault. And present us before God with great joy. Because he is the Savior who is due glory, majesty, power, and authority now and forevermore. Wow. I hope you're encouraged by that. I hope that you are, are thinking, how can we contend for the faith? How can we drive that stake in? We were created by God. Yes, we're fallen, we're sinful, and we live in a sinful, fallen, broken world. But he came into it. We're going to start celebrating that in Advent. He came into it. He actually took on flesh and blood and dwelled among us. Lived a perfect life. The Bible says that he knew no sin. Died on a cross to bring us to God. Rose again is seated at the right hand of God the Father and calls us to live in that amazing, amazing joy, that amazing, amazing depth, that amazing, amazing strength because he can keep us from stumbling. He can present us without fault with great joy before God the Savior. Hanover Church, grounded in the truth of the God who made us and loves us, may we gently and firmly proclaim trust in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father makes, makes us want to just say thank you. Thank you. Lord, I don't think we want to sign up for a battle necessarily. We're a little timid when we hear that you will be persecuted and that there's an adversary that wants to destroy us. But that's the life you've called us to. And you've already won that battle. And you can keep us from stumbling. 
that you can present us without fault and joy. So Lord, I pray that we would contend for the faith. That when we hear things that are, are just not what the Bible says are true, that we would lovingly, firmly and lovingly and gently say, no, this is actually what it says. Lord, I pray for that pastor in Chicago who went on record in the newspaper denying what the scriptures teach because it's politically correct. Lord, I pray for her heart. I pray for her to know you. And I pray for the people that sit in that congregation, thousands of members on the role of that church. And Lord, that's just one place. I'm not picking on them or picking on her. Lord, there are so many places where, as the scriptures say, there's a, a form of godliness, but lacking the power thereof. Oh, Father, humble us. Humble us. Teach us ground us in the truth of your word, ground us in the, the truth of, of the faith, and allow us to contend for it earnestly, gently and lovingly. Lord, if there's no one here that has ever bowed their knee in repentance to you, I pray that today would be the day of salvation, that they would say, Lord, um, forgive me. I give you my sinful running of my own life, I turn to the cross, I trust you for life, save me. And you will. You bring forgiveness and grace and mercy. Lord, for those that have bowed their knee at the cross, have received your grace, and have been followers of Christ for years, decades, I pray for the encouragement of another day, the encouragement to be grounded in who you are and your love for us, and that we would then earnestly contend for the faith that you handed down from generation to generation. Thank you, Lord. We need you. We love you. In Jesus' holy name we pray.